Pleased to say we can speak to uh, Niels Gilman in Los Angeles, who is co-founder of the Transition Integrity Project, vice president of the uh, Bergeron Institute. Thank you for your time. I hope, I, I know I did a very brief outline of what you did there, but I hope I did it some sort of justice. Take me through the basics of the scenarios and why they all seem to point to things not going so well. And in fact, what is happening right now? Right, well, uh, in June uh, of this year, we ran a series of exercises that basically tried to game out what could possibly happen um, if we had a president who was unbounded by norms and unconstrained by his own party. Um, and what we concluded was that uh, you know, the, the results of the game were that absent a decisive victory for Joe Biden, the threat to the integrity of both the electoral process itself and then the transition to a new administration were potentially quite severe. Um, and indeed, much of what the players in the games anticipated could happen have come to pass. Um, Trump and his, uh, and his supporters in right-wing media have projected a narrative that the election is being stolen, mm -hmm. um, and they aim to contest the results through a variety of kinks in the electoral process, uh, both at the state level and at the electoral college level. Did any of your scenarios extend beyond this political uh, problems we're seeing now into the idea of even some sort of civil unrest? Because there was a lot of concern in the days before the vote that things could get out of hand. Yeah, well, what we found was in the games where the election results were very close, both sides called their supporters into the streets with obviously great risk that there could be contestation, uh, a violent contestation between competing groups of protesters. And in fact, you know, what's actually happened is that the election is not all that close. I mean, the Republicans are claiming it's close, but in fact, it's not very close. Um, you know, there have been at least 10 elections in U.S. history that were closer than this one, including 2016, 2000, 1976, 1968. Mm. Um, so, in fact, what we have is a situation where I don't think that the Trump uh, team has a real viable path to winning this election. But I'm not sure that even that's their goal at this point. What they're trying to do is lay down a marker that the results are illegitimate so that mm. they can continue to contest and fight the Biden administration into 2021 and beyond. OK, so let's, Nils, do our own little scenario here from now where we say legal action happens, it's unsuccessful, the 538 electors meet in December and everything goes according to the numbers as they are and Joe Biden is confirmed. Then what? If Donald Trump still doesn't like it, I mean, all bets are off, right? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't think he's actually going to physically resist leaving the White House, okay. uh, you know, if it comes to that. I, I would be very surprised. I mean, at some point he gets frog marched out of there by the Secret Service and told to, you know, get in his car and go back to Mar-a-Lago or wherever he wants to go. Um, but he's not going to be allowed to stay indefinitely. And I don't think it'll come down to a physical confrontation. I think what he wants to do is be able to have a basis to continue to activate the 70 million people who voted for him. Uh, and the many more people who are fans of his and continue to use them to continue his career as a political celebrity. And I believe that he will continue to do that in a way that's quite untraditional, right? I mean, if you think about the way in which most presidents um, conduct their post-presidency, mm. they basically go off into the, into the sunset. Trump, I believe, will be just as unconventional in his post-presidency as he has been in his presidency. And he will continue to be in the spotlight, criticize the existing administration, uh, perhaps even seek to run again in 2024. It's very possible. Nils, just quickly, obviously you want to be accurate in your research and your scenarios. When you did all this back in June, was this one where you were kind of hoping, I hope I'm not right? Well, obviously the reason why we ran the games was not merely to anticipate what could go wrong, but to plan to make sure that things that might go wrong would be uh, mitigated. Um, and I think the one reason why things have gone reasonably well is partly because of the work that members of the Transition Integrity Project, as well as many, many others across the country have done. You know, secretaries of state, both Republicans and Democrats, have done a fantastic job of ensuring that the vote went according to plan um, on both in the run-up, mail-in voting, early voting, and on Election Day, November 3rd. Remarkably smooth, um, very mm. few stories of disruption. This is part of what's challenging for Trump and his legal strategy to contest the results, is there was very few reported results of any irregularities. Um, you know, if you have 100 irregularities, that would mean only one in a million votes was irregular, right? We right. had 150 million votes cast. So, you know, that's not going to be decisive at all. Um, and so I think that the prophylactic efforts that were made in the wake of the Transition Integrity Project 
have been important for making sure that the worst did not come to pass. Nils Gilman is from the Transition Integrity Project. Fascinating talking to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.